Today's post in Adullam's Cave Music is another psalm uh, on the theme of Zion, Psalm 87. It's a brief but very significant and important psalm on that theme. Um, and I have a, a longer introduction to this today because it, it goes back a bit to the origin of Adullam's Cave Music and many of the hymns that are being posted on it. So if you want to skip the introduction, just uh, go on to where you see my hands moving on the guitar and uh, you can listen to the psalm. We've been saying that Zion is a key theme in the psalms, which is the song, but not just of the Jewish church, but of the New Testament church as well. And we should expect Zion to be a central theme because, of course, the visible church ourselves, we represent Zion on earth. Uh, Bill Brody's hymn, uh, uh, the two hymns that we um, were looking at, and also John Newton's hymn, were based on Psalm 87. And this psalm celebrates Zion as the place on earth which is loved above all places by Almighty God. For Israel, that represented, of course, Jerusalem. For us, it is still true, but Zion is not in a geographical place. It is wherever his church is, and especially whenever they gather together in worship under his word and under the authority of his son in his word. So in Israel, Zion represented the heavenly Zion where God and his anointed Messiah were enthroned and where God was continually worshipped. Uh, and we get a window into that in the book of Revelation. But as we've been saying, the earthly Zion was intended by God to be an aid to the faith of believers in the Old Testament so that as they saw it and came there, their faith would rise higher uh, to worship God in the heavenly Zion and not merely at the earthly temple. So there'd be a continuity between the church in heaven and the church on earth whenever they uh, were thinking about what Zion was. So Zion is represented by God's church on earth. And when we sing about Zion or pray about Zion, as we're told to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, we're taught what I've called top-down thinking about God's church. And by this, I mean this is a corrective to how most of us tend to think about church in a bottom-up way. For instance, when we think of seeking the welfare of Zion, we tend to begin with ourselves or our immediate circle, and then perhaps the local church we're part of, or maybe even our denomination or wider associations uh, in a, a national or international movement. But we rarely think of the church in our town, or the church in our nation, or the church in the world. And the whole concept of Zion is intended to embrace all of the church that God loves and that Christ died for and rules over. Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, not just for individuals in the church. And so if Christ loved the church, so we should love the church. We should love Zion. And that's what Psalm 87 is saying to us. And it's what we're saying when we sing the psalm, which is probably rarely done today. In God's eyes, Zion is glorious. In his top-down thinking, Zion is glorious. And psalms like this are intended to help us think about Zion in a top-down way as well, to see the church and Zion as he sees it. This was written, uh, this psalm was written about the church of God after the exile in Babylon, uh, where God's people had been humiliated they were despised in the sight of the world. The city was in ruins and the temple, which was representative of God's palace on earth, had been totally destroyed. But God wanted them to see Zion, his church, as he saw it, glorious, with a glorious future ahead. And so the psalm says that God had chosen Zion and had established it on a foundation that was holy and therefore eternal. And no matter what the nations might do to it, no matter how humiliated Zion might be, those foundations could never, ever be shaken. It was his city. 
the nations that had attacked and oppressed and despised Zion actually, the psalm says, would come to so identify with Zion that they would want to be citizens of Zion. They would be numbered amongst those who were registered as born in Zion. And they would regard being members of Zion as their greatest privilege. Indeed, it goes on to say, Zion would become the cause of their joy, and not just joy, but the springs of all their joy. And the nationalities that are represented in the psalm are representative of heathen nations that would become members of Yahweh's household in Zion, Babylon, and Egypt that attacked and oppressed Israel, and some of her more immediate neighbors as well, and some of the distant neighbors, such as Cush. Uh, this is representative of international uh, nations, uh, strong and great, small or insignificant, that would delight, would find their joy in being numbered as members of Zion. And we who are Gentiles are examples of the fulfillment of this prophecy when we're born again, not just citizens of Ireland or England or wherever it might be, but born again as citizens of Zion. Calvin says, though at the time of the return from captivity, the future glory of Zion could not be perceived by human sight or reason, the prophet urges them to view the fulfillment of the word, what God had said about Zion, as from a watchtower. And I think there's a crucial lesson here for us for top-down thinking. Calvin goes on to say this, the psalmist gives evidence of his zealous love for the church, not just, and these are my words, not just for his local church or denomination, but for Zion, his love for Zion, his love for the church. And Calvin goes on, he stirs up the godly to cultivate the same zeal for Zion, that we would have the same zeal as the psalmist has and that God has for his church. And then Calvin goes on to say this, all our affections should be focused on the church rather than the pleasures and pageantry of this world, for there is sufficient to engage and satisfy us in the spiritual glory of Christ's kingdom and that alone. What he's saying is that when we see the church, when we see Zion and being a part of Zion, as God wants us to see it, there is a well, a constant spring of joy and delight that we can draw on in our lives. This is part of what Paul is saying in Philippians when he says, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice as we behold and see the Lord Jesus enthroned in Zion. In his church. The psalm couldn't be clearer. God's saints are citizens of Zion through the new birth, and this should be a reality for us by faith that is a continual source of joy for us when we read what the word says about Zion and contemplate on it. And so the challenge in this psalm is whether we think in a top down way, whether we think about the church beyond our local church or our local denomination? Do we see Zion the way the psalmist sees it here? And that's why singing these psalms is so important. The origin of Adullam's Cave Music goes back to the 1970s. In the providence of God, I was blessed to be involved in an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that transcended local churches and single denominations. Believers in Christ were coming together from all denominations in a work of the Holy Spirit that covered every continent on earth. And the understanding of the church as Zion became something more of a sort of visible, tangible reality. It became a prominent theme, and hymns like Bill Brody's are representative of ones that were written in that time. But then as that movement of the Spirit became more, shall we say, domesticated, by denominational organization or became made localized in local churches, the vision of Zion became lost. And in my own experience, being part of what was an interdenominational community where there was a real sense of believers drawn from different backgrounds, a real sense of Zion. Uh, and out of that community, many of the hymns in the Dullam's Cave music emerged that uh, when we were forced into having to become a local 
denominational or independent church. The preoccupations of managing a local church, meeting the needs and expectations of members of the church, brought the vision of Diane more and more down to bottom-up thinking and lost the top-down thinking. And even though associated with international movements and Christians in other nations, uh, the vision of Zion tended to become eclipsed within the boundaries of particular movements or wider organizations. And so the vision of the universal church, the vision of Zion, the top-down thinking, the glory of Zion was something that uh, became less and less prominent in our thinking and our praying and our worship. I'm going to say a bit more about this tomorrow, but there are two challenges, I think, in singing the psalm. One is to behold the church, to behold the glory of Zion as God beholds his church. His church in the world, his church in our nation, and then down, thinking top down, into our local church. And the second challenge is to find as much joy in being a member of this Zion as the psalmist describes, singers and dancers say, all my springs of joy are found in you, in Zion. Mm -hmm. The foundation of his city on his holy mountain stands. Yahweh loves the gates of Zion above all in Jacob's land. Of God's city, glorious things spoken right and truly so. Egypt, Babylon, no Zion, other nations, her behold. Philistia, Tyre, and Cush, that to them Zion gave birth, they will say regarding Zion, everyone. Yahweh records and recounts in his register everyone that's born in her. Singers, dancers, music makers, all in Zion join to sing. All my springs of joy are in you. 